Today's text comes from Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 11. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Alex. If you can find your seats, we will go to the Lord in prayer, commit this rest of the time into his hands again. Holy Father, it is with great joy that we come into your presence not, Lord Jesus, because we have uh, much to give. We bring loaves and fishes to you (laughs) to borrow from examples in the New Testament. But we come with joy because we know that our lives are hid with Christ in God, as your word has said. We come with joy knowing that we worship you as Father and not as judge, that Christ has made a way for us so that we might be called children of God, all those who have placed their faith and trust in you. We come with joy because even though we don't understand all of these things, Lord, you have changed us. Your spirit has quickened us and anchored us uh, as a guarantee of the salvation that we await as we journey through this life, Lord, until you call us into your presence. We thank you that in your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Lord, we just acknowledge this morning that the things that we say, oftentimes, even in our worship, are things that we aspire to, and so we confess those things that we fall short on. We also, Lord, give you praise for the fact that we can sing songs and pray prayers that anticipate a work of God that we can't even put our fingers on yet and even know how to communicate, but we know to be true because our Savior has risen from the grave. And has promised these things. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the work that you have done and are doing in our hearts. We thank you that you are faithful and just, Lord, to accomplish these works that you have begun in us. And we look forward to that day, Father, when we can completely rest in your presence. Until then, Lord, we gather together out of uh, respect for your word, which calls us not to Uh, forget the assembling of ourselves together and we gather together and encourage one another in the faith. We gather together to to help one another grow and to be strengthened in our walk. And we ask, Lord Jesus, that as we do these things in faith, knowing that you have called us to them, that your Holy Spirit would do the heart work that is necessary for us to be changed, that all of us would leave here inspired by the strength that you give and Uh, with the wisdom that you give for life and that we might leave here with the joy that we've already prayed about and given you praise for. That the things of this world would not rob us of the more eternal things. Not that they can be taken from us, Lord, but we can be robbed from enjoying the beauty of them on this earth and of the encouragement that they bring. And so, Lord, I pray for those who have come that come with different weights and responsibilities and I ask Father, that for these moments you would give them peace and pause as they try to discern outside of this place how to manage and do what they're called to do or to bear the weight that they're bearing, either through sickness or through hardship in their life. And I ask, Father, that your grace would sustain them, that you would encourage them. Lord, answer their prayers, I pray. Speak life over these who have come. Say it and it will be, that they might be encouraged in their walk with the Lord and strengthen to follow after you with more urgency. Your word says that the kindness of forbearance of God leads to repentance. We don't want to be those who turn away from that kindness and continue in evil, but we also pray that you would remember your kindness, your mercy once more, and that you would do a work of grace in our hearts, Lord, to draw us closer to you, 
to strengthen us where it need be. Thank you for our time together. I pray for every church in this city that is being faithful to you. Cause your face to shine upon them and bless them with the same blessings that we are asking of you this morning. And we ask, Lord Jesus, as well, for every church in this city that has lost its way, that is turning away from you, that you would bring them to a point of repentance and renewal. Uh, Father, that there might be a strengthening of the light of Christ in this city. And if they will not turn, Lord, would you remove their influence that they might not cause confusion concerning the name of Jesus Christ. And in that same prayer, we ask, Lord, that this church would be protected from falling away into devious things, but that you'd keep us, you'd keep us true to the truths of the word of God and committed to those things that you have given, knowing, Lord Jesus, that we are pursuing uh, a city not built with hands, Look forward with eyes of faith, uh, faith as those who have gone before us to that city whose author and perfecter is Christ, our Savior. Oh, do a work in our hearts, I pray now. Help me to be able to speak in a way that is uh, clear for your people that they have come to learn more of your word. Uh, Father, that you might give, get the praise for everything that takes place today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, before we dive into our text this morning, just a couple quick little announcements. First of all, uh, the, um, the picnic tonight, you may want to bring maybe a lawn chair or something just in case uh, we've got enough, uh, several tables out there in the, fel in the um, that little building outside, whatever that thing is called, the shelter house. We've got several spaces for everybody. It's really going to be a fun time. Uh, deacons have worked hard to make, uh, make sure that that stuff uh, gets put together well. And so we just look forward to that. And the Lord's given us just a wonderful day to be able to enjoy that. And also, I just wanted to remind you, I know there's been an announcement about the Honduras medical mission trip. I'm planning to go on that trip in January. So uh, if you need a little encouragement and you just want to know that there's some guy that you know that speaks Spanish and <laughs> can go down with you, uh, I would be tickled to death to know that you want to be a part of that. So if that interests you, January 20 through 29, uh, you can talk to me after the service or to Scott Strauss right here, if you can just, that guy right there, he's got the same haircut I do, he just got cool glasses, so look for a bald guy with cool glasses and you'll find Scott just, uh, we, you know, we, we have to huddle together for warmth, everybody who has that same kind of look. Colossians chapter 3, if you would mind kind of going there in your scriptures, there's a Bible there in front of you. We've been working really through the scriptures here for a little bit with respect to Paul's admonition to the Colossians, and it's really an amazing passage if we look at it. Paul has left us, as he is normally given to do, uh, a tremendous deal, uh, amount of theology, rather, to help us prepare for the application of the Word of God. <coughs> Excuse me. And really what we're getting to now in this next section of Colossians chapter 3 is the application that this is why I told you what I told you, that you're called to do certain things as Christians that will manifest that you really have been changed and that you're different as you walk with the Lord. And so he really starts to put his fingers on some things that will hopefully make us feel uncomfortable because we are enculturated and we need to repent of sins that often, uh, so often beset us. But then also because we are so apt in our culture to walk away from the patterns of life that God has actually established to help us grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has created us a certain way. And when we function outside of that pattern, we actually hurt ourselves. And so this text, just know as we go through it, is meant not only to bring conviction to you and to me as Christian people, this text is also meant to help us remember that God is a good God. I mean, he's showing these things to us for a reason, that he might uh, show us more of his mercy and these things that he's called us to. He is gracious and long-suffering and encouraging to us to help us see that we are created in a certain way, and that way will actually help us succeed in this world and in this life. And so as we kind of go through this particular section, just know that that's Paul's intent. And what he does in preparing us for this is he starts to use analog analogous language or figurative language to help us understand exactly what we are to do. And so as we read, there's language of putting to death the things that are earthly or uh, to put on the new man and to put off the old man. There's this analogy that kind of helps us understand this as, as if it were a piece of clothing. It's like, we've got to get rid of this old self and let me go ahead and get, and get changed. Uh, when I was in college several years ago, a long time ago, uh, 
uh, we, we, uh, I attended a small Christian university, and they had a dress code. And it was, there's a reason why I don't wear a tie often. And part of the reason is I had to wear a tie every morning, at least a tie. And if there was some special function or official function, you had to have a coat, a suit on, a suit coat on. And, and so, you know, here we are in South Carolina, and it's roasting outside. And I came from Calgary, and I'm just sweating everywhere with this knot on my neck. And, and that just wasn't common for me. And the other thing that wasn't common was to learn that the tie really needs to match the outfit. It took me a while to figure that out. And I remember oftentimes being late, going out to class, and just grabbing whatever tie I could, sitting in class one day, and I was speaking to a lady, that was a girl that was behind me, and on a whim I said, hey, does, does this match? And she was smiling, and she just shook her head. <laughs> no, I can still see her eyes in that discernible disagreement, like, what were you thinking? Five minutes earlier in a little time. And this is really the analogy that Paul, I think, is drawing for us, that there are aspects of life that we lived before Christ that clash with the kind of life that God wants us to live now. It's a very simple analogy that he's using. That put off the old self and put on, put on the new anticipates more of a concerted effort and focus than perhaps just laying out an outfit and making sure the tie is correct. There's something intentional, there's something good that we're to consider that helps us walk in a way that honors the Lord. And so I want to spend some time this morning under this category that he gives us. There's really two lists that Paul gives us in this uh, little list in chapter 3. We're going to focus on the first list that he gives us. It's a list of sinful categories. And I want to start by asking a question, why this style? So we've looked at this particular section and we've read how Paul does this and, and how he's communicating, and he gives us several things to consider. But why this style? And it's helpful to ask that question because we can't forget that Paul is writing to an audience in his context that would understand a certain kind of cadence and analogy to help them grow in the things of the Lord. And, and, and really, that's important for us I, to consider that it's not just our culture that is affected by these things. There are other cultures that are affected by this. That particular culture and the cultures previously, God spoke to them in ways that were tangible. I think of what one of the commentators says, catalogs of vices were common form among pagan moralists and in the anti-pagan polemic of Jewish propagandists, those are big words. Such lists appear repeatedly in Paul's letters, receiving a special significance from the Christian context in which they are set. In other words, there were, there were problems within the culture of the day that were being spoken to, even by non-believers. And they were using these same kinds of patterns of lists and this kind of an analogy to help those non-believers in their culture to, to find a better way. I mean, there was a, an overabundance oftentimes in these kinds of sins that Paul is going to uh, highlight. And even non-believing contexts recognize the problem that that was to their culture. But just to underscore, I think, a few things with here, we need to understand how to more, how, more clearly how to live our lives. This is basically the sense of what Paul is giving us, first of all, in this particular section, uh, and why he is writing the way he is writing. The Bible is not given to us to be a mystery, to be hidden. And I'm highlighting these things because I want you to understand how you and I then ultimately ought to use this example to function in our world as we're communicating truths that are going to conflict with the current cultural uh, belief systems of our day. To use clear language, to use language that is tangible. For instance, the Pentateuch, if we go back to the Old Testament, is written in a style that was common for that day because God was reaching those people through that writing. The, the way that, that Moses even wrote the law of God was the same way that law codes would have been written. And so we can actually make these comparisons to ancient Near Eastern cultures to see what was taking place and how the Word of God is actually more redeeming and compelling than what was seen in those particular cultures. We are to be considerate of these kinds of things. God wants us to speak plain talk with His truth. If you remember what Paul says, that he wasn't speaking with words of wisdom and all this eloquence. He just wanted to communicate the truth of God so that people could get it. And that really is an example for you and for me, to be careful, to use every act, uh, bit of resonance that we have for the, for the glory of God to simply make truth known to those who will listen. So we're to understand more clearly how to live. I think the way it's written here as well is to understand that man is the same in every time in history and culture in the world. Why this style? To highlight again that it doesn't matter if you're during the, living during the time of Adam and Eve after they had sinned or living now. 
We all struggle with these same things. And there's just this, this sin of mankind that is constant that we have to be aware of and recognize that this battle has been raging, not just in 21st century the United States of America, but in the world's history because we are wont to desire those things that are unrighteous. And then thirdly, I think just to understand that Christian people were manifesting these kinds of actions despite the relationship with Christ. That's why Paul was speaking these things. It's like, hey, you guys got to wake up. There's, there's wickedness out there and, you, and even within your own context. We are enculturated. We need to be saved out of this culture, my friends. And so he is highlighting and underscoring that you and I as Christians need to be transformed by the Word of God. This ethic that we're going to speak about this morning, this morality that God desires of us, is obviously has implications for the world that is outside. But Paul is concerned for the revival of the Christian church, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12, for instance. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not inside the church those whom are, you are to judge? And so the sense is very clear that you and I as Christians need to be concerned about what this looks like, not so much out there, but here. Am I reflecting the kind of life pattern that manifests that God has made a transforming work in my life? And if there is an aspect of my moral compass that is moving me away from who God is, then why am I moving that direction? I think that's what Paul is reaching to. And I think that actually helps us set up for this next little section, which is really to look at the list of items that are given. So let's take a look at this. This is verses 5 through 6. I can just read this again for you. If you have your Bibles there, it says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual morality, impurity, passions, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. We're going to basically look at verse 5. Uh, I'm sure that you weren't surprised that I wouldn't get through that whole particular section because you know me better than that. But let's start just by pecking away at this first section, which is sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is the word pornea in the Greek. And I like to use oftentimes the Greek words uh, that, that help connect some dots for us uh, that are familiar to us, not because you need to know the Greek, but sometimes they just knowing that little word helps us think, okay, there's a hold that I have that will help me remember. When the Bible translates uh, this phrase, sexual morality, it's translating the word pornea, for obviously from which we get our word pornography. It has the sense of, uh, this is the whole list, it has the sense of unlawful sexual intercourse or prostitution and unchastity. And really it can encapsulate this as any unbiblical expression of sexuality. We, we are told that we are to put these things away that we're to put these things off. And again, as I was uh, commentating earlier, that Paul is concerned that this is something that is in the Christian church and it needs to go out. Paul is concerned that at times Christians would function in such a way that even the Gentiles were scratching their heads as to how and why Christian people who said they knew God were functioning in a way that was so abhorrent towards this particular aspect of life. And I'll give you as an example, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There was a man in an immoral relationship with women in the church. And, he's, and God says in that particular section that even the Gentiles were wondering why it was so, uh, such a, a horrible uh, relationship that he had. And it shows you how deeply uh, inserted we can become in our sin, even as Christians. And Paul gave some instructions as to how to deal with a person who was so committed to that particular sin and that time, and he gave instructions to the church. But again, we're writing to the church. I'm not so much concerned about the fact that the world struggles with this. You and I, as Christians, have been given the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth, as Jesus says in John. You and I have been transformed by the power of the gospel. If you are a Christian, then you need to walk in a way that is aware of these kinds of life patterns as being immoral before the Lord. That reaching out to any kind of sexual deviance, anything that's going to lead me into some sexual promiscuity of any form. And that really is helpful, especially when we consider the kinds of things that we're putting before our eyes or the way that we're navigating, the way that we're actually moving in our life in the course of our comportment and how we're to function, how we're to interact with other people. 
Paul says that we are to consider them as, for instance, to consider men, consider ladies as your sister until the Lord opens up a door for you. If, if there's a, a relationship that you're going to develop, that's the kind of expression that you're to have towards uh, someone of the opposite sex, that you're there from their family. You treat them well. You're concerned about this particular sin having a place and a hold in your life. Now, to be sure, God has created sexual experiences to be enjoyed within the, conflict, the confines of marriage. It is something that God wants to honor in our lives. It is a blessing for you and for me. And just to remember this, this is actually helpful, that this isn't created by God, that sexual desire isn't created by God just to dangle a carrot in front of us and leave us all chafing because of uh, these passions that he has created and that we're trying to manage. He has provided a means through which these things can be expressed. And we know that that means is marriage, biblically speaking. Again, we're speaking to the church. This is what God requires for you and for me. And so when we think about this, we remember that God created man, he created woman, and he created this covenant of marriage. There's a relationship that is to be brought together. And this relationship is given this blessing of sexual intimacy. So why is that particular gift given in marriage? Well, we can look at Scripture and know that it's given as a means to bring another human being into the world. This is what God says in the Scriptures. He even speaks through the prophets when he says, what have I desired in wanting children but to desire a godly heritage? And that was, that was really a clash against the way that the people in, the, in that particular time, the Jewish time receiving this from the prophet, were functioning. There's a godly heritage that you and I as Christians are to bear up in this world. Let me just ask the question, how many of you came to know the Lord uh, because your parents were Christians here in this church? I mean, that's, that's a major percentage. And we see that one major source of evangelism and transformation in our life is the family, what God is doing in and through our homes. So marriage is meant to bring children, another human being, into the world. It's also meant this... In this relationship is meant to recapitulate the covenants of marriage. I, I am saying to you again by living in the flourishing of this relationship within our marriage that I am committed to you. And not just that, but it's the singular commitment to you. No one else. And this really is an amazing gift that God has given. And this sin in our lives of desire for the ways that God has commanded us not to function is something that is so detrimental. We want to reach out for those things. We want that forbidden fruit. And the Lord is calling us to something better. Now, I need to raise this. We might find ourselves thinking that since I haven't given myself over to these kinds of sins, that we have somehow fulfilled all that God requires in this arena. And I want to scratch away at this a little bit and then think about this. Uh, with respect to intimacy within marriage. Why has God given this intimacy within marriage? I've mentioned several things. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we also understand that, that intimacy within marriage is given as a provision to help us to be faithful to this calling of purity. And so we see that our commitment to uh, our spouse needs to encourage faithfulness as well in these areas. If I can put it this way, uh, if, if this is a provision that God has given to faithfulness in our lives and our spouse's life, then when we become a hindrance to that faithfulness, when we refuse to share our lives in that way, we become an obstacle for their success. This is a problem within Christian marriages oftentimes, is the is the robbing one another of what God has intended to give to help us succeed in a culture that is so apt to give itself to those vices that dishonor the Lord. So, can we be guilty of actually impeding faithfulness towards sexual morality? Absolutely. And we as Christian people, especially in a context like this, need to be concerned about that in our own marriages. And can we find ourselves reaching out and participating in all that is unlawful? Absolutely, and that's why God has called us to consider how we are to live. 
Now, more broadly speaking, I need to just press on this a little bit more because sexuality and the misuse of sexuality is a disastrous hammer in our culture right now. Let me just say that this word reaches more broadly uh, than even just this, but to consider the comportment, uh, uh, our comportment in our lifestyles, am I causing someone by virtue of my speech and my actions to be led into a path that will ultimately lead them to failure and lust? I think that's a good question for you and for me as Christians. Remember, we're being redeemed from the culture, and what we are being told here by Paul is to understand that there is no part of our life that is not touched by the power of God and its transforming grace. But also, in that statement, we understand that there is no power of our life that has not been touched by sin. And that's why God has to hit everything when he cleans us and makes us righteous before him. So, dear friends, are you being an obstacle in someone's battle against this by your comportment, by your actions, perhaps your invitation to things that might open their eyes to things that are dishonorable before the Lord? Are you being faithful to your calling, brother and sister in Christ, if you're in a marriage relationship, to be celebrating what God has designed? To be sure, the scriptures make very clear that marriage is to be between a man and a woman. And there's no distinction between a man who is biologically a man at birth and gender in the scriptures. So my brother and sister in Christ, it might be apropos in a culture right now to make distinctions, but you are not of this world. You are bought with a price, says the scriptures. Therefore glorify God in your body. We move on to another word. Paul just likes to hammer away this is why I think they're like, okay, you need to go to another missionary journey. <laughs> Leave us alone. No more words, Paul, please. He just nails us with another one, which is impurity. And this word looks like a Greek word, when you, even if you spell it out in English letters. Uh, uh, catharsian, a catharsian, the word A, which stands for the prefix, against, and catharsis, which is familiar to most of us. Catharsis is a purging or a purifying in medical terms. And so you put those two things together, and it basically means uncleanness. I don't want to live in, an, in a clean way, is what Paul's saying. you got to get rid of that stuff. You can't live in an unclean way. It's, it's, it's not healthy for you. This is what Paul is calling us to. What are those things that lead us to uncleanness? What are those things that move us towards unrighteousness? It's anything, really, uh, if we're not careful, that can lead us towards embracing things that are uh, that are not right and, and, and whole. I think about Psalm chapter 1. This is a great psalm if you don't know it. It begins with such a clear and strong statement. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. So there's this sense of, hey, you want to be successful in these areas? Then make sure that your life pattern is not surrounded by these influences that are wrong. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners. It's not just that I'm actually perusing through life and all these obstacles of, uh, that people are putting before me that are dishonorable to the Lord, but now I am just lingering. I'm standing around enjoying all of that darkness. And then Psalm 1 continues on, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat with scoffers. So it's now my life pattern to just, to just enjoy this kind of relationship. And Paul and the scriptures are calling us to something different to something more pure, to something higher, to something that honors who God is. Uncleanness should not be a part of our life. If you're a Christian, you are a child of the King of Kings. Live, my friends, in the dignity of that holy calling. Sexual morality, uncleanness, and passions. Passions is the word pathos in Greek. And in our particular lexical use, pathos just has the idea of suffering, uh, and it was used that way, but context in Greek and in our, uh, in our context as well uh, kind of can be a little bit stronger. We have to know what kind of suffering or even uh, how this is used. It was used as suffering, but it also had a breadth uh, of, of understanding, meaning strong desire in the Greek language. Uh, and context again, because desires can be good or bad. Are my desires honorable before the Lord? 
the things that I want and desire before him? Am I being faithful to display desires that manifest a life that is changed? Do we measure our passions against what they inspire in our hearts? That's a good question. Because that'll tell us whether or not our passions are honorable before God or not. What is it inspiring in my heart to do? And then we move to evil desire. Obviously, these kind of seem connected. You can kind of see Paul writing down all these things, just trying to get this whole, like, let's just give me, let me just give you the, uh, that, that mixture of ideas that are necessary. Uh, what is it, Neapolitan ice cream kind of thing, right, where you get all these different flavors. I'm just going to touch everything that's going to affect your life in some way. He moves to evil desires, which, again, can be distinguished. A desire is not a bad thing. It has to be context that tells us. And context tells us that Paul is talking about desire that is evil in this particular section. Do we desire evil? Well, that might be kind of broad. Let me put it this way. Uh, what happens when someone whom you disagree with experiences something difficult in their lives? Does it make you happy? <laughs> Finally. Finally, it came back around to get them. Yes, now they know. You know what Proverbs tells us? I think I have it here. Lie not in wait as a wicked man against the dwelling of the righteous. Do no violence to his home, for the righteous fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked stumble in times of calamity. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn away his anger from him. Evil desire. I wish that these, name your political party that you disdain, would just fail. <laughs> Evil desire. Not wanting righteousness to bear upon the lives of those even with whom we have disagreements. Paul kind of continues on with this, and he lands finally uh, on one that connects the whole idea that is inspiring all of this. He touches covetousness, which is greediness, avarice, and ultimately covetousness, he says, is idolatry. I am reaching for something that is competing for God's place in my life. The reason I celebrate sin is because I love it more than I love God. That's the connection that Paul is making. I love what R.C. Sproul does in his book on holiness. If you're not familiar with it, I would encourage you to read it. If you want a copy of it, we'll find a way to get you one. It's an excellent, it's an excellent book that I think is very helpful. But he talks about the rich young man. If you're familiar with this particular passage in Matthew chapter 19 and also Luke chapter 18, this rich young man comes to Jesus. You can almost see it, polished, affluent, well-spoken. And he comes to him and he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, right away, knowing what is in the heart of man, why do you call me good? There is no one good but God. And we see in the very moment, as is brought out in this particular book, that what Jesus is doing is getting to the root of how this young man sees Jesus. You see, if he's just a good teacher, then he's not enough to bring him to salvation. But if he is good, then Jesus is God. That's really what Jesus is getting to with this man. What do you think about me? And then this man obviously needs an answer to his question. So Jesus says, you know the law. The law was already given, basically. Uh, you should be able to go back and measure your life against the law of God. And he says, honor your father and your mother. And he basically lists that last section of the Ten Commandments. And the young man in his pride, I have fulfilled all of these things from my youth. <laughs> Could you imagine? It's like, just how arrogant can we be sometimes before God? It's like, really, we're having a conversation, even with a good teacher. And you're going to tell that guy, when you don't even know how to get to heaven, that you fulfilled everything in that particular section? And that's how sin really is. We think we smell better than we do. We think we look better than we do. And we think we act better than we do. Jesus really is gracious. And I think this grace is why we're so drawn to him. Of all the things that Jesus Christ could have said, all right, do you remember that time when you did that? With, I mean, he's God, right? He could have remembered all those things. He just comes back to this issue 
of where his heart was and what he really loved. I tell you what, young man, sell everything you have and give it to those who need and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And the text says that the man went away sorrowful because he had much wealth. You see what the problem was ultimately? There was something competing with God's place. He said he'd kept the last section of the Ten Commandments. He hadn't even kept the first one, which is to love God and have no other gods before me. And that's what sin does. It always competes with God's place in my life. And these particular sins that touch our passions and satisfy us, the scriptures say that sin is pleasurable for a season what the evil one does not want us to see is the death that comes after. Oh, dear friends, if this is anything, let it be a message that calls us back to faithfulness. Faithfulness in our affections. To love our Savior again with the passion that he deserves. He gave his life for us that we might be redeemed and transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. This truly is mercy, that we should see the encumbrances that are so common to man and see the grace of God that is so uncommon, but yet so available for all who would put their faith and trust in him. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for how you work and move in our lives. We humble ourselves before you, Lord, recognizing that we fall short and we just ask that you would help us to love you more, that we might be found more faithful still. In Jesus' name, amen.